And I forget if you know what kind of dog he is. Yeah, um, he's a Dachshund Terrier mix. That's so adorable. Is he, but is he like long and short like a Dachshund? Yeah, he has like the stumpy limbs and long body, but then he has the face of a terrier. Oh my goodness, that's really cute. Um, unfortunately, none of our listeners can actually see Toby. Um, maybe if you, wait, can you show him to our YouTube watchers slash listeners? Like right now? Yeah. Okay, he's asleep. I'll go get so. Oh, no, no, no. Okay, okay, okay. No, you he'll don't... wake up. Oh my god, okay. He, he, he always sits here. He's scruffy. He's getting a trim tomorrow. So. Oh my goodness. Hi. I mean, if anything is going to drive traffic to our YouTube channel, it is this. Cute he's, dogs. Yeah, he's a, he's a scruffy one, but tomorrow... He's oh my god, now we have two dogs. <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> Toby, do you see a friend? Hello and welcome to the 538 Politics Podcast. I'm Galen Druk. I hope everyone had a nice July 4th. Thanks to a new survey released by Pew last week, we're now able to take a more detailed look than ever at the 2020 electorate. We can see what the electorate looked like overall. So for example, about 30% of all voters were either millennials or Gen Z. We could also see where Biden and Trump gained or lost support compared with 2016. For example, Biden's gains among married men were the largest of any demographic group assessed in the survey. We're going to dig into that data today to get a fuller picture of 2020 and also to give us a better sense of where the two parties are headed. We're also going to check in on what's happening with the effort to count the ballots and name a winner in New York City's mayoral race. So you may actually know more information or you may even know the result of that election or something close to it by the time you're listening to this. But the process has been a fiasco. It's taken weeks as we expected, but errors from the Board of Elections have caused frustration and some are wrongly blaming the method of ranked choice voting. So we'll talk about that. And of course, we've also got a good use or bad use of polling and as usual, and here with me to do all of that is politics editor Sarah Frostenson. Hello, Sarah. Hey, Galen. Also here with us is politics reporter Alex Samuels. Hello, Alex. Hey, Galen. And elections analyst Nathaniel Rakich. Hello, Nathaniel. Good morning, Galen. Good morning, and good night to listeners who are either listening to this in the evening or maybe Wednesday morning. Um, so today's good use or bad use of polling is a little bit different. I'm interested in knowing the best way to survey Americans about their concern over crime. So first, some background. Overall, crime has been in decline in the U.S. since the 1990s, but there was a 3% increase in violent crime nationwide in 2020, according to preliminary FBI data, and a 25% increase in murders. There are various theories as to why this is happening, and it's unclear whether this is a pandemic-era anomaly or a prelude to more crime. This is also an area where Joe Biden does poorly with the public. So according to an ABC News Washington Post poll, 38% of Americans approve of the job Biden is doing on crime, while 48% disapprove and 14% have no opinion. So how big of an issue is crime overall compared to other things like coronavirus, where Americans approve of the job Biden is doing by, say, 30 points? So according to the same ABC Washington Post poll, 59% of Americans believe crime is an extremely or very serious problem in the U.S. generally. Meanwhile, 17% of Americans say crime in their own area is extremely or very serious. That's up from 10% last fall and the highest since 2000. So what I really want to understand here is not whether or not this is a good or bad use of polling. I think in general, just polling things that are happening in the country is a good use of polling. But I'm more curious to know which gives us a better sense of what Americans are thinking about when it comes to crime. Is it concerns nationally or concerns locally? Because there's a big difference, of course, between 59% and 17% on the other hand. So who has thoughts here? Which which is the best use of polling? I would say locally. Um, there was actually this really interesting New York Times, it's like an online survey of their readers where they asked um, you know, people who responded to the survey essentially whether they thought Chicago had the worst murder rates nationally in 2020. And over half of respondents said yes, like Chicago was first. Um, but the real answer is that Chicago was seventh. 
And I think in part what that illuminated was because there's this national depiction of Chicago being, you know, the crime capital. I'm thinking specifically of former President Trump saying that Chicago is worse than Afghanistan. I think it's easy for people not living in these places to latch on to these ideas of crime being higher in certain areas when it's not. So I think polling for this at the local level might give a better picture of what's actually happening versus asking people at a national level how they feel about cities that they don't live in. Yeah, Alex, that's a really good point. So like, as you mentioned, the New York Times surveyed its readers and found that people both on the question of whether or not Chicago is like the crime capital of the United States, but on lots of kind of nationwide questions about crime, readers were not really kind of getting it right. So for example, the New York Times asked if the US murder rate was higher or lower than it was in 1990 in 2020. And 60% of respondents said it was about the same or higher. And it's nowhere near the murder rate in 1990. In general, overall crime actually declined in 2020. And you know, more than 70% said it either stayed the same or was up. And so, you know, I think it is true that people have like a pretty skewed perception of of crime, even though, of course, as we mentioned at the top, you know, murder rates are rising in the United States significantly. What were some of the other misconceptions that people had about crime? Not specifically in that poll, but basically what I've also found is that Americans always seem to be convinced that crime is rising. So this was a separate piece from Mother Jones, but essentially what they found was that in 22 of 24 Gallup, 20, sorry, 20 of 24 Gallup polls conducted between 1993 and 2020, at least 60% of Americans said they believe crime is going up nationally, despite data showing a general downward trend during most of that period. I mean, I think Alex is right that in understanding um, the actual crime rate, it's more important to zoom in on what people are looking at locally. That said, though, people are just really bad at estimating what crime actually looks like in their communities and nationally. So if you want to understand, I think, where the conversation is and what that could mean in terms of an election um, upcoming in 2022, it can be a lot more telling to look at the national level. And, you know, one thing that really struck me in the Gallup polling I was looking at was this huge gap between the local and national. It was like 40 points in 2020, um, both being up. And then, you know, with that Washington ABC poll, you know, another increase there. And I didn't really find a good explanation for why there is such a huge gap between local and national. There was this one study I was looking at that was talking about, you know, their hypothesis was that those living in more dangerous areas might, you know, overestimate crime. I personally probably would have had the opposite <laughs> hypothesis going into that, thinking more along the lines of immigration, where often communities that don't have a huge inflow of immigrants often have the most fear or concerns around immigration. However, they found that, you know, in counties where crime was on decline, at least nationally, they weren't really overestimating what crime looked like any more than people who lived in areas where it was getting worse. So that wasn't really explaining why we're so bad at that disconnect. It wasn't disputing that there's a disconnect. The researchers found that they were trying to identify like what it is about crime that makes us so bad at estimating it. And where they seemed to land was it was more so around media perceptions of it and that people just really don't have a good sense and their surroundings don't really influence that much in terms of how they're thinking about crime, which I thought was surprising. I think I'm noting both numbers, but I would agree with Alex and Sarah that the local number is probably more important. I mean, we're here in 2021. It's an odd year. Odd years are election years in cities and towns. You know, municipal elections tend to be held in odd years. And so I think obviously people who are voting on the issue of crime in a municipal election are more likely to consider what the crime situation is in their local area versus what it's like nationally in terms of factoring crime into their vote. Maybe as we move on to certainly 2024, um, you know, when the next presidential election is the national number will become relevant. But personally, I would be surprised if crime remains a dominant issue for the next three years and isn't 
overtaken by any of the two million news cycles that's going to happen between now and then. Um, the midterms are an interesting maybe in between situation. You could imagine that people might vote based on a national perception of crime, given that they're electing federal representatives. But on the other hand, you recently had a special election in New Mexico's first congressional district where that election was very much a referendum on crime, particularly in the Albuquerque area. And the Democrat ended up doing very, very well, even exceeding Joe Biden's performance. Um, so it's not really clear that the Republican candidates' attacks on the Democrat being soft on crime made a difference there, even if the perceptions of crime, um, both locally and nationally, uh, in that case, were high. One question I had about the methodology of this poll, since this is our good use or bad use of polling segment, is the options that they gave respondents when thinking about crime. So the options were like, how seriously do you do you consider crime as an issue? The answers were extremely, very, moderately, not too concerned, not at all concerned, no opinion. So when looking at this, I'm thinking like if I'm if someone's asking me this question for me, like what's the difference? between extremely and very, or moderately and not too concerned. Like, Nathaniel, why give kind of five different choices instead of just, are you concerned about crime or are you not concerned about crime? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I'm not quite sure I agree. I think that there is some bleed through when you um, ask too many or give people too many options. But of course, I think probably someone who was conducting the survey would say more granular picture is more useful. I don't know. There's a trade-off when people do that. I think maybe in this case, they have just been asking this five-part question for, for so many years, or I, I believe that um, ABC News uh, and Washington Post like adopted this question from Gallup's wording. Um, and Gallup has been asking this question for, I think, like 20 years. So it might just be kind of a desire to have it be an apples-to-apples -apples comparison with previous years, um, rather than necessarily people here in 2021 deciding that it is the best way to ask the question. But I, I'm honestly not sure. I think there are trade-offs. Yeah. And, and to that point, you know, the way in which they top line presented the information, they aggregated very serious and extremely. But when I was looking at the crosstabs, it was interesting. You know, there were equal shares of Democrats and Republicans who said the problem was very serious, 32 percent. But far more Republicans said it was extremely serious versus Democrats. That was 37 percent versus 24 percent. Interesting. And also, as we oftentimes see in polls like this, where people have a bunch of answers to pick from, the most common or like the plurality for both national and local was the middle answer, which is moderately. So moderately concerned about crime, which I think we've talked about in the past as being somewhat of a challenge with polling, that if you give people a bunch of answers to pick from, there's just a trend towards the middle that um, is just explainable by people picking the middle option and, and not maybe reflecting like a deep feeling that they're moderately concerned about crime. But anyway, Nathaniel, you mentioned that you saw crime as sort of fading as a national issue over the next three years. When it comes to how this question, how this issue is going to impact national elections and national debates, as I mentioned, um, this is not an issue where Biden polls particularly well. Uh, Alex and Sarah, how do you see this impacting the kind of national political debate? Do you agree with Nathaniel? I mean, I think Republican operatives see the debate over rising crime rates and by default police funding as a pretty potent issue that will be front and center in 2022 and perhaps part of the party's overall strategy in retaking the House and Senate in future elections. Obviously, the issue of crime motivates um, Republican base voters. And I think that there is the belief that Republicans might be over to win over Democrats or independents in certain states and districts where crime might be particularly high. I'm not sure that's the case, though. Um, of course, like you mentioned, Galen, Biden is polling pretty poorly for his handling of crime, but that doesn't necessarily mean Republicans are polling well on it. So in that Washington Post ABC News poll that we're looking at now, 35% of respondents said that they trust Democrats to do a better job on crime, but only 36% said they trust Republicans more. And then there's still that 20% of voters who said that they trust neither party. Yeah, but I think as Alex was getting at, though, we do know that it is more of a motivating factor for Republicans. For example, in the lead up to the 2020 election, 
Pew found that 74% of registered voters who supported Trump said violent crime was very important to their vote versus only 46% of Biden's supporters. So if we are in a national environment where more Americans are saying that they're concerned about crime, I do think you're going to see the GOP double down on that. Now, whether that has a message that appeals to independent voters, voters on the fence, or is just something that plays to their own base, that's a separate question. Because as Nathaniel was getting at earlier, like the electoral evidence we have so far in terms of how this has worked is really all over the place. You know, at the same time that Eric Adams is about to win in New York City in the mayoral race, you had India. Not so fast, not so fast. <laughs> not so fast, not so fast, but we'll see. I know I know we'll discuss that later, but I think Vera Fote, um, who's analyzed all of the various ranked choice elections, makes a strong case for why he has a pretty solid lead. But at the same time that Adams is in the lead in New York, you had India Walton, a Democratic Socialist candidate, win um, in Buffalo. And, you know, that kind of countercuts this narrative that Democrats are necessarily going to be super vulnerable on the defund the police narrative. That said, though, House Democrats did do a 2020 autopsy report, unlike Republicans, um, looking at, you know, well, why did Democrats underperform in the polls, analyzing, you know, both polls, but then voter files as well. And they had found in their analysis that in some of the more moderate districts where they had expected to win, they thought defund the police. Police, um, had hurt those candidates there. So it's really a contentious issue that I think isn't as clear cut as a lot of the media narratives suggest, but it is something that could be potent here moving forward in 2022. Yeah, Sarah, I agree. I think that the, um, if anything, frankly, the electoral record so far here in 2021 has been on the side of um, kind of progressives and, and maybe people who are um, less pro-police. You also had Larry Krasner, the very reform-minded district attorney of Philadelphia, decisively win re-election over a more conservative challenger. So I think the verdict is very much still out on whether Democrats will actually suffer from this issue going forward. Although that's on primaries, right? Yes, that's a fair point. But um, primaries that are essentially the general is what I, you know, in these well, cities. Yeah, primaries, but in like very democratic areas. Right. Already. Fair enough. That's fair. All right. Well, let's move on and talk about the big Pew survey I mentioned. Last week, Pew released its verified voter survey, looking at how different groups within the electorate voted in 2020. It's generally considered to be one of the most comprehensive pictures of trends within the electorate and helps to explain why Biden won and Trump lost. The survey includes responses from 12,000 verified voters in November 2020, about 10,600 voters two years earlier during the midterms, and about 4,000 voters in November. November and December of 2016. It used voting records to ensure that surveyed adults actually voted in those elections and results were weighted to represent the U.S. adult population by different criteria like gender, race, party affiliation, and so on. So just to kind of like set the table here, what are the benefits of this verified voter survey in taking all of the steps that I laid out there for understanding the 2020 election over, say, an exit poll, which we had basically the night of the election in 2020. Generally speaking, exit polls actually are a really great way to understand what different groups support each candidate, right? They were a mess, though, in 2020, given the pandemic, because the one value add that makes an exit poll different from a regular pre-election poll is you know the person voted. In 2020, that was more difficult because so many people voted absentee. And so we just didn't have that kind of granular understanding of the electorate. The other really cool thing about Pew's data is it's a panel survey, which lets us understand in a more granular way how voters are actually shifting their preferences or not over time. To Sarah's point, it's considered a better estimate of voters and demographics than exit polls because Pew takes their survey responses and then matches the respondents to public state voter records, which I think helps eliminate the possibility of Pew's survey over-reporting how many people voted, um, which is a thing that could happen in some exit survey data. Now that we've gotten this Pew survey, which I think is like the final big survey that we'll get of the 2020 electorate, we've also seen other surveys come out that have different methodologies, but paint a similar picture. 
you know, how how much better of an understanding do we have today of what happened in the 2020 election? I think two of the biggest trends that, you know, was true in this Pew survey, but then was also pretty evident night of was that, you know, Biden won the election in part because he won suburban voters. He improved Clinton's vote share by nine percentage points, winning 54 percent of their vote versus 45 percent. And another thing that we had noticed um, in a lot of our analyses following the election is this was in large part due to gains among white suburban voters. To be clear, Trump still narrowly won this group of voters, 51 percent to 47 percent. But Biden's inroads were significant. Trump had carried this group by 16 points in 2016, whereas now there was only a four point difference. That's huge. Second factor here was independent voters, which Biden won by nine points here in 2020, whereas Trump had actually won them by one point in 2016. Yeah, another thing that we see in the Pew survey that really backs up what we have known basically since election night uh, is that Democrats um, made um, dr- made losses with uh, Latino voters in particular. So according to Pew, Biden only won Latino voters 59% to 38%, and that's down from Clinton winning them 66% to 28%. Um, but I think that one thing that's, that's interesting about the Pew uh, poll, um, and this is something that was pointed out by friend of the pod, Nate Cohn at the New York Times, is that you know the, the racial patterns are kind of easy to see based on election results um, because certain counties are very heavily you know, Hispanic or black or white. Um, but th- a lot of the more detailed things that maybe didn't get as much play early on, like what you mentioned up front, Galen, the um, Biden's improvement among certain kind of conservative, traditionally conservative groups like married men or veterans, um, that comes out in the Pew survey. And that's something that we can't kind of see based on electoral voting maps and patterns. Does the survey data give us any sense of why? Um, you know, I think we, to a large extent, as you've said, this backs up trends that we previously saw through either, you know, how certain precincts are voting or the exit polls as kind of unreliable as they may have been in 2020. Like, can we get any closer to an answer of like, why, why these shifts? I mean, I think the biggest thing here is, you know, a lot of the shifts we saw in 2020 were really a continuation of trends that were either true in 2016 or before 2016. So what do I mean by that? Well, age, for instance, that continued to be a huge split. That's something, though, that has been true since 2004, where Democrats have consistently done better with younger voters. But then there's a huge urban-rural divide, and really, I should say, urban-suburban-rural divide. That, again, was more pronounced here in 2020. And I thought that was interesting in terms of Hispanic support moving away from Biden here in 2020. What we really saw, though, was it was Hispanic voters without a college degree. And that is true of voters writ large without a college degree backing Republican candidates. Biden did make some gains with white men without a college degree, but it was very much on the margins, five points, I believe. And so what we are seeing here is kind of this huge realignment along lines of class and education more so than um, race to some extent. I mean, to be clear, black voters still overwhelmingly backed Biden. Hispanic voters, the majority still backed Biden. But there are large educational divides emerging in the electorate, along with geographical ones. Yeah, I don't think that the survey really gives us any more clues as to the why. You know, I think that the Hispanic voter question has been asked to death. And, you know, you guys did an entire podcast on it. Um, but, uh, you know, one interesting thing, theory that I saw floating around uh, regarding the married men, Biden's improvement among married men, is um, the fact that maybe a vote by mail did help Biden in that way because married men were more likely to be filling out their ballot alongside their married uh, woman, their their wife. (laughs) Um, And and maybe kind of that um, persuasion or that household discussion um, maybe made the the men more democratic. Wait, interesting. Yeah. Does anyone, do people buy that? It seems plausible to me if very difficult to prove. Um, But you know, it is kind of interesting that you saw the gender gap narrow, um, you know, based on not only this Pew data, but, you know, we've seen that in some of the other kind of post-election um, postmortems as well. 
Yeah. Though I would say the gender gap was really interesting because that was something in particular, like following election night, you really didn't have a good sense of how that was breaking down. And I think there were actually initially like some misreporting around the how the gender gap broke down um, based off the exit polls. But I do think like with married men and then also college educated men edging more into Biden's camp and then white women, but white women without a college degree edging more into Trump's camp. It really, to me, spoke more towards the larger educational divides we see in the country, kind of explaining why that gap shrunk in some ways. And this was another theory on the married Ben front that I saw floating around, but I didn't know if like attitudes, there was like a negative attitude toward Clinton in 2016. And maybe some men were more inclined to vote for a male candidate, which is maybe why Biden had uh, had some gains there. Yeah. So Biden, to put numbers to it, won 44 percent of married men in 2020. And that's up from 32 percent for Clinton um, in 2016. You know, it seems like to a certain extent, as you were describing, Sarah, some of the divisions within the country, perhaps along educational lines seem to be clearer than ever. But it seems almost as if other divides, like the gender gap, which was historically high in 2016, and on race, of course, you mentioned that Black voters were largely unmoved. Black men, as particularly younger Black men, were a little bit moved um, in the 2020 election. You know, like, is is really education the thing that's going to start driving politics here? Does this seem like, like like a prelude to what's coming down the pike? Or do we actually think that like the divides are lessening a little bit because of some of these, you know, divides along gender and race and things like that are smaller? Traditionally, college educated voters, white college educated voters have been part of the Republican Party. That is no longer true. And it hasn't been true for a while, right? In the same way that You know, since Carter, Democrats um, up until Gore had essentially always won white voters without a college degree. That that flip flop happening there, um, I think, makes it hard to kind of understand to what extent that is reshaping the parties. Right. Because on the one hand, the share of white voters without a college degree in this country is shrinking. But the share of white voters with a college degree and voters who aren't white with a college degree is capped, right? Like, you know, I'm always surprised, but it's like roughly 30% of the country have a has a college degree. That means 70% doesn't. And so there are there are other factors then that are animating voters and how they choose to align with either party. Some of that's probably explained by geography as well. There are still huge geographic divides. And I think it's an open question here with the suburbs. You know, yes, um, Biden did win the suburbs here in 2020, but I think an a understressed value in that is Trump still won white suburban voters by four points. And yes, Biden made huge inroads there, but it does perhaps suggest that that those gains are more tenuous than we realize. Yeah, I also just wouldn't um, lose the forest for the trees here. I still think that race is the biggest dividing line in American politics. Like certainly education is an important kind of sub fissure. Um, as Sarah mentioned, you know, the difference between college educated Latinos and non-college educated Latinos, um, was significant, although not as big as the difference between college educated and non-college educated whites. Um, but it's important to note that even non-college educated Latinos were still a pretty solidly democratic group. According to Pew, they voted for Biden 55% to 41%. So it's not like they are, you know, voting, voting fully like, um, white non-college educated people. I think the, the kind of the racial, um, dimension is still winning out in terms of having more, um, more pull. Um, and also I would also note that, um, there was no difference at all among, um, college educated black voters and non-college educated black voters in the Pew survey. They were strongly democratic both ways. Let's talk a little bit about how the electorate overall is changing. So yeah, Trump and Biden see some gains or losses compared with 2016, but the actual people who are voting is different too. What are some of the biggest trends in how the electorate in America is changing um, as illuminated by the survey? 
So I think the biggest change, and this has been decades in the making, is that non-college educated whites are getting smaller and smaller of a portion of the electorate. And that's both because educated whites are gaining and because America is getting more diverse and and therefore non-white voters are gaining. So in 2020, um, again, according to Pew, um, only 42 percent of all voters were um, uh, white and didn't have a college degree. And in the past, that number, you know, that that has been a majority of voters. Yeah. The other thing that stood out to me was, um, and I, I struggle so much with the decade names, but bear with me, the baby boomers and the silent generation, they're finally out of the majority in terms of voters. And um, they had been above 50% in 2016, but fell to 44% in 2020, meaning that millennials and Gen Xers made up the um, 40% of the electorate. I think there's a question there about, you know, we saw historic levels of turnout in 2020. Does that hold true in 2022? Is not a fair comparison because it's a midterm year, but you know, 2024, and then you know, does 2022 match 2018, which was also a high year of turnout? On the Democratic side, one thing I found interesting is that Democrats won about two thirds or more of Asian American voters last year. Obviously, that's a huge voting block. It's the fastest growing non-white community. Yeah, I want to nail down on some of the the larger changes here. Millennials and Gen Z, as I mentioned, made up 30% of the electorate in 2020. And both of those gener- – of course, millennials, much larger portion than Gen Z because, you know, younger people vote at lower rates. But also Gen Z is still aging into voting to some extent. Both of those generations voted for Biden by a 20-point margin. Now, obviously, Gen X, baby boomer, silent generation, are still a large portion of the electorate, which is why it wasn't a blowout. But should Democrats expect those margins to remain that big as millennials and Gen Z kind of age like on its face, like it's a pretty basic pattern right now of older voters tending to vote more Republican, younger voters tending to vote more Democratic. And that, of course, held in 2020. Um, but to your question, Galen, I'm not entirely sure whether we can whether Democrats can count entirely on younger voters. Pew found millennials um, showed a slightly bigger lean toward Trump than they did in 2016 with his share among that generation moving from 31 to 39 percent, which I found interesting. Yeah, I'd also noticed that so 18 to 29, so some millennials, but also some Gen Z, Trump also relative to 2016 did better, 35 percent. So I think Alex is right that, you know, some of the narrative around young voters just overwhelmingly voting Democratic, like, yes, the proof is in the pudding that happens, but it's also not quite the full story there. Like Republicans are also, you know, still still winning some of that vote. Yeah, I mean, anytime we talk about generations, you're talking about time horizons that are decades long. And so like in 30, 40 years, are millennials still going to be as democratic as they are now? I doubt it. You know, there are lots of things that can happen in American politics. The parties could completely realign themselves. The preferences of millennials themselves could change as they, you know, they get older and, um, you know, their their priorities change. Um, But I do think it is worth noting that one of the reasons that I think millennials and Gen Z are more liberal is that they're also more racially diverse. Um, And so I think, again, it kind of keeps coming around to that. I think that Republicans, you know, to win elections 40 years from now, they are going to have to uh, learn to appeal to um, to non-white voters, which again, you know, they may be starting to to figure that out with uh, with Hispanic voters, although, you know, again, one year it's not necessarily determinative of a, of a future shift. And, and there are many, many decades to left to see how, where this goes. Yeah, no, I mean, as Nathaniel says, I think that's kind of the big unanswered question here, because it is unprecedented. These are the most racially diverse generations in the US, right? 
Um, and also, you know, Ronald Brownstein had done this piece for The Atlantic where he was kind of walking through a number of these studies. And I thought he made a good point in one of his interviews that the GOP emphasis on the culture wars might not resonate as much with younger generations um, as they think. Now, some polls have shown for young Republicans, it is a particularly salient issue. They're worried about cancel culture. They're worried about wokeness. However, as we were just talking last week on the podcast, you know, we've seen that younger Republicans think climate change is real. We, we haven't seen, though, the Republican Party kind of lean into a more pro-climate change um, messaging. So if they kind of double down on more racial appeals, like, will that work as much with millennials and Gen Z? And I think the answers we're seeing so far, at least among, again, like, college-educated millennials who are fitting into this pattern, like, there's been a greater shift that those voters aren't buy, buying racial appeals. They're more concerned about climate change. And that could signal problems, I think, for the GOP. And maybe they are lasting gains for the Democrat. Right. This is the million-dollar question, right? And, you know, Republicans in recent years, certainly under Trump, have signaled that they are interested in doubling down on their current supporter base rather than trying to reach out. Um, and this includes, frankly, a lot of their kind of more authoritarian moves, trying to restrict um, voting of people who um, who aren't within their base. And th- that seems to be a path forward that they've chosen. And but, it, you know, assuming that we continue to have free and fair elections in America 40 years from now, that's just not going to work. Um, so are they going to be able to to make that course correction? Um, do, will they need to make that course correction given how kind of um, undemocratic some of our institutions are becoming? It's a, a massive question for the future of, of this country. Yeah, looking a little more immediately here at 2022 and 2024, Sarah, you mentioned a piece that Ronald Brownstein wrote in The Atlantic. I want to read a quote from that and see what you guys think. He writes, quote, The cumulative message of these studies is that we should brace for more years of grueling trench warfare between two coalitions that are becoming more and more inimical in both their demographic composition and vision of America. And to top it off, they appear to be about evenly matched. So looking ahead to 2022, 2024, do you agree with what Brownstein writes? Yeah, I agree with that for sure. In fact, I think that Brownstein's entire article was excellent. I highly recommend that listeners go read it. It's over the Atlantic. The Atlantic. Yeah. I, I struggled with it. Um, I do think it was a really smart, well done article kind of tying together all of the different studies. Um, and I think that the point that elections, you know, are going to continue to be closely contested is a valid and important one, because ultimately, I think what he's writing to is something that took people by surprise here in 2020, given the vitriol of the Trump presidency and the COVID-19 pandemic, and what the polls were showing leading into 2020, was why wasn't it more of a Biden blowout? Um, And that's because of our two-party system, right? But but when Brownstein says if the two parties are evenly matched, that's where I start to quibble a little bit right now, because I do think that there is this shift realignment happening around education and geography, and the lines are hardening, and I'm not sure what that means for the two parties as that breaks out. It's also possible that the GOP can still have a electoral advantage, even though they have far less people who identify as Republican. I mean, if you just want to look at the last... Um, seven elections, the Democrats have won the popular vote, but not always the presidency. And is some of how much of that, though, has to do with, you know, institutional structures? And what does that mean in this country moving forward and that dynamic? Wait, so sorry, so you don't think they're evenly matched? Which side do you think has the advantage? <laughs> that, that, fair <laughs> enough. That, throw it back on me. I think at this point, based on what we saw with millennial and Gen Z turnout and how overwhelmingly that broke for Democrats. Now, the question is, does that turnout hold here in 2022 and moving on? But that was a huge split towards Democrats. I also think we really don't know yet what it means that those two generations are the most racially diverse. Now, that could have um, a lot of upswing for Republicans, as we saw with some Hispanic voters, um, particularly those without a college degree breaking for Republicans. But overall, it feels as if some of the, you know, 
coded dog whistles we've had in a presidential election since the 50s and 60s around race, around policing. Even now, like we were talking about crime at the outset of this podcast, but when you ask people, okay, like you're concerned about crime, well, what's the answer? You aren't seeing the same responses around like, okay, well, it means more police in cities. I think then with those kind of changing uh, perceptions around race in the U.S., it is kind of more of an open question then of how the two parties are going to sort themselves and what that means for the bases of both parties. I'm struggling to say, though, which party has the advantage, because I think the thing I can't get out of my head is that only a third of the country is college educated. And so if the Democrats start sorting on that more strongly, what does that mean for voters who aren't college educated? What does it mean for Republicans if it's just co- just voters who don't have a college degree? Do they actually have the ability to make inroads with voters of color who don't have a college degree and have that be a lasting change? I don't think anyone would dispute that. It's like more people in the U.S. identify as Democratic Um, or as Democrats. And when you look at the popular vote, Democrats are consistently winning it. That said, Democrats are very poorly distributed across the U.S. when it comes to how the Electoral College works. But now, so, right, so Republicans still then have like an institutional advantage in elections. It's why they win elections. Um, But does that mean the parties are evenly matched? I agree with what I thought was his point about Democrats and Republicans just having radically different versions about, you know, what's best for the country, views for democracy. So you talked about the parties like moving further and further away or something like that, if I'm getting that correct. Um, But as far as the individual coalitions go, I don't know if I can say for like with 100 percent certainty right now that the trends that we saw in 2016 and 2020 are here to stay or are going to be around forever or even in elections in the near term future. In 2022, like after we've had just like a year of anti-democratic policies at the state and federal levels, is there not a world in which people who voted Republican in 2016 and 2020 maybe moved to support Democrats? Like, I don't know, specifically with like millennial voters and Hispanic voters. um, I just don't know if those gains um, that Republicans saw in 2020 will be, you know, forever for their party. Alex Burns in the New York Times had this interesting piece about why our politics just seem like stuck right now, despite changes in the electorate. And one thing I found interesting is that each little shift in one party's favor one way, at least in 2020, seemed offset by another small shift in the opposite direction. So Trump improves his performance among women and Hispanic voters who typically vote Democratic, and Biden expanded his party support among men and veterans who typically vote Republican. So I'm not sure what that means for the future. I don't know if it's going to be look like a more sort of even demographic on each side, but I was just, you know, I thought that was an interesting fact. Yeah, definitely. I wonder if that's a factor of the increased turnout that just, you know, when you get the maximum number it wasn't the maximum but a high number of everybody to vote um kind of each group kind of maybe regresses to the mean a little bit um which is another reason to question whether that will continue in the future all right well all we have to do is uh track it so you know we'll we'll get answers someday but for now let's wrap up with a check-in on the ballot counting process in new york city we've been following the new york city mayoral race and after tallying the ranked choice preferences last wednesday the race tightened from eric adams leading by about 10 points to adams leading Catherine garcia by only two percentage points wiley is closely following in third But last week, things got confusing when the Board of Elections accidentally counted 135,000 test ballots and released results including those ballots. The board issued a statement saying that, quote, ranked choice voting was not the problem, rather a human error that could have been avoided. Many, including the candidates, have expressed frustration with the Board of Elections, and some people have also expressed frustration with ranked choice voting. So let's break down what's going on here. Sarah, you alluded earlier to what the results might be once all of the absentee uh, ballots are in and counted and kind of ranked in in terms of ranked choice voter preference. But, you know, how where do things currently stand in in terms of trying to assess the winner of the New York City mayoral race? 
well. I, to be clear, I'm stealing Nathaniel's thunder here. This was a point he made in his write-up um, after the first batch of votes was released. But the voting reform advocacy group Fair Vote has tracked 398 single winner ranked choice voting races in the U.S. since 2004, and 383 were won by the candidate who was leading after the first round. And so that was why I was saying at the outset that I think Adams here stands a really good chance of continuing to be in the lead and to ultimately win the primary because of the 15 come from behind winners that Verifote found only three overcame first round deficits larger than 6.2 percentage points. And obviously here Adams is ahead of that currently. I will say though, you know, with the um, release of the um, kind of ranked choice tabulations last week, um, Garcia really made up a huge amount of ground, um, really uh, you know, uh, an, an anomaly um, in terms of, as Sarah said, the, the history of ranked choice voting. Um, and so it does seem like she has the potential to gain, you know, maybe 10 points um, from her, the first round to the last round, which may be enough to to give her the win once all the absentee ballots are counted. That's what we're waiting for right now and what um, you, know, you folks listening might have a better sense for by the time you hear this. Is there a reason to believe that Garcia is doing way better amongst uh, absentee voters than Adams or Wiley? Yeah, the absentee ballots are generally considered to be good for Garcia. If you look at the distribution of where um, most of the absentee ballots are, at least where absentee ballots were disproportionately cast, um, it looks like a lot of the places in Manhattan that Garcia ran well among Election Day voters. Um, in addition, absentee voting is generally done by people who are better educated, um, and that group in New York City has been Garcia's base. Okay, so... There was a fiasco last Tuesday, as I mentioned. The New York City Board of Elections released tabulations with 135,000 test ballots, which were not actual, you know, votes by New Yorkers, but part of their testing process. So the Board of Elections has that to apologize for. But it seems like people are somewhat conflating challenges at the Board of Elections and waiting for absentee ballots to come in with problems with ranked choice voting as a way of voting. Um can we try to like sort through what is true and not true about ranked choice voting as a system for voting and, and whether or not ranked choice voting has anything to do with this? Yeah, the vast majority of the delay is not due to ranked choice voting. It's because, quite frankly, the New York City um, Board of Elections is extremely slow at counting absentee ballots. And in fact, this is a problem statewide in New York. I don't know if people remember, but after the 2020 and 2018 elections, um, you know, we didn't get, and, and in some primaries as well, um, sometimes the winners weren't declared for weeks after the fact um, because New York puts up New York law puts up a bunch of barriers um, that you have to do X and Y and Z before you count the absentee ballots. And that means that absentee ballots, at least in New York City, don't get counted until starting a week after the election um, is over, which, of course, most states are able to process absentee ballots um, on election night or even earlier. That is actually something that New York is going to change going forward. They recently passed a law that will allow pre-processing of absentee ballots. But um, but yeah, the, the reason for this multi-week delay is because of a kind of the um, the inertia of election officials rather than ranked choice voting. That said, ranked choice voting, um, it does take more time than a typical election because you do have to run those multiple rounds of, you know, kind of eliminations and stuff like that. But for example, in Maine, which has used ranked choice voting since 2018, those results just take a few days. Yeah. And, and to Nathaniel's point, like this is definitely a product of the board, the elections board era more so than it was for ranked choice voting. But I mean, this is happening at a time when there is disillusionment with the election system. And so the board's error, I think, gives actors with bad intentions a place to stake their claim. And if anything, it helps further a narrative that U.S. elections are inherently fraudulent or illegitimate. I believe uh, Trump issued a statement about, you know, something about, you know, this is similar to what happened in 2020, even though it's not similar at all. Um, and so, yeah, just to be clear, like, there's nothing nefarious going on here. Um, like you said, Galen, this was a product of human error, and we will, we will eventually know the results of this race. But the, um, you know, just the slowness in knowing the results has really nothing to do with the voting system. 
Yeah, I mean, so ranked choice voting has gotten some criticism even before all of this, in particular from one of the candidates, Eric Adams, who has, you know, because in part, uh, Catherine Garcia and um, Andrew Yang sort of teamed up and said, rank us first and second um, on your ballot, said that it was marginalizing voters of color in the city um, and kind of like sowed some doubt in whether a ranked choice voting election is legitimate. Uh, kind of where is that coming from? And are those criticisms true at all? It's a hotly contested um, argument, right? And in some ways, you know, given that Garcia and Yang made an alliance, you understand why Adams is doing what he's doing. Um, There was a study, gosh, this would have been looking at um, San Francisco mayoral elections from 1995 to 2011. Um, But it did find that there was a relationship between ranked choice voting and decreased turnout among black and white voters, younger voters, and voters who lacked a high school education. Um, it did not have an impact among more experienced voters. Also, you know, a number of studies have tried to look at, you know, one reason why there are proponents pushing brink choice voting is this idea that it makes our elections less acrimonious, it raises the profile, People should be voting more about, okay, I want to back this candidate. I get to do multiple choices in case my first choice doesn't win. And while there are studies that show like that has happened where like people are voting more on their beliefs and going further down the ballot, it hasn't necessarily made the elections any more uh, or any less acrimonious. I mean, we saw that in New York. There was plenty of catfighting <laughs> leading up to the actual election. Um, but In terms of, you know, how much does ranked choice voting actually deter people from voting? It has, you know, some studies show lower voter turnout. To be clear, though, polls leading up um, to New York implementing ranked choice voting, it was overwhelmingly popular. There's not, um, it's not a clear cut answer, I think. Um, It is something, though, that is like very technical and wonky. And so it can be, I think, depicted in ways where it's not accessible to um, every voter. But it can also, I think, it can take on whatever narrative the politician ultimately really wants to give it. I guess I think that both the benefits and the drawbacks are a bit overblown. Um, You know, I think clearly ranked choice voting was invented to fix this problem of vote splitting and it can do that at times. Um, and that is good. Um, right. I mean, if you have a democratic candidate who gets, uh, 40% and a Republican candidate who gets 45%, but then the balance went to a green party candidate and maybe those greens would have preferred the democratic candidate to win ranked choice voting kind of fixes that. But based on the statistics that Sarah cited earlier, that ranked choice voting almost never kind of changes the actual outcome of the election based on who won the most first place votes versus the final, um, tallies, you know, it seems that that benefit may be somewhat overstated. Um, similarly, I do think that the criticisms are probably a bit overstated. You know, I think obviously anytime you introduce a new um, kind of voting system, it's going to create confusion. It might lower turnout, but I think that doesn't necessarily mean that that is a long lasting effect once people kind of start to get used to it. And to be clear, in this New York City mayoral race, there was record turnout. That's a good point. (laughs) There wasn't in San Francisco, but good point for New York. All right. Any final thoughts here on on New York City's mayoral race, board of elections, or ranked choice voting before we wrap up here? Well, gosh. Well, if Nathaniel's right, where Garcia leapfrogs um, Adams, that will be quite the story to cover. That's all I have to say. All right. Well, we will see what happens. Maybe, listeners, you already know the answer. But let's leave it there for now. So thank you, Nathaniel, Sarah, and Alex. Thank you. Thanks, Galen. Thanks. My name is Galen Druk. Tony Chow is in the virtual control room. Claire Bidigary Curtis is on audio editing. And Emma Riley is our intern. You can get in touch by emailing us at podcasts at 538.com. You can also, of course, tweet at us with any questions or comments. If you're a fan of the show, leave us a rating or a review in the Apple Podcast Store or tell someone about us. Thanks for listening, and we will see you soon. <laughs>